This is the Lex Free Podcast, where we abridge the Lex Podcast with love by replacing everything Lex says with a pleasant guitar strum. Enjoy. Yeah, uh, an F student of history. F student. Yeah. Okay, I thought it was more like a D minus. D minus, yeah. Okay. Still got to repeat the grade if you get all D minuses. I actually had a point sixty seven GPA average my freshman year, and I had to do it again. This is this podcast is going to be the spectrum of human intelligence. This it runs the, the gamut. From... Oh, I thought you meant it's in size. Uh, well, that, size. I think they're correlated. Yeah, <laughs> I saw him. I've been in Austin a couple of days. I saw him once. We had eight meals in one day. Eight meals. Yeah. He, so I feel like I've been here longer than I have just because of the meals with Dylan. <laughs> Kid likes biscuits and barbecue. Okay, so he's more like. See, I was I was imagining Putin or somebody like that. He's more like the North Korean uh, dictator. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. All right. They so, get along great, those two. Yeah, they would get. I mean, Tim Dillon and King John Um would be like. They could make like a buddy cop movie. They would yeah. get along like Lethal Weapon. That great. would be a good pitch movie. Yeah, you don't want to give him power. You don't want. I don't even want him wearing a suit. Like, I want a guy who's as thoughtful and educated as you wearing a suit. Like, because, you know, suits corrupt you. You put that suit on, you start feeling yeah, that power. You start, definitely. It's like, you know, yeah, I don't even want Tim Dillon in a suit. Power would, he would kill people. He'd get rid of anything that he deemed. I mean, if you made a lobster roll and it wasn't up to Tim Dillon's standard, he would have you executed. The entire would, restaurant staff is he, just gone. He would have people below his food standard executed. There'd be programs, not of people who are political dissidents, but of people who don't meet his food standard. His cuisine standard is high, and he's usually right. Yeah, he's a rare breed. He's like a benign king. I've, I've, most people I meet who are like really powerful are like douchebags, and that's how they got there. I think that's psychopaths have the advantage because they don't have feelings. And Joe's a rare example. He's just a powerhouse of will. And uh, he, uh, I do think about that. Yeah, I think um, I should be stopped right now. <laughs> Just stop me right now because, yeah, power for me, I would, when people get power, they indulge. I don't think it changes anyone. It just reveals your darkest. Yeah. You know, people aren't supposed to have anything they want. You got to be able to struggle for everything. So I would have a harem. I, I'd be like a Roman dictator. Yeah, I'd be like a Roman emperor. I mean, people call them emperors. They were dictators. The most effective leaders are dictators. I hope we get back to that. Democracy hasn't worked. I'm ready for a secession of Caesars, and I want to start with AOC. That's <laughs> <laughs> true. Dictators get the job done. They I, do. They do. At a certain point, you got. That's why social workers can only get you so far. You need yeah. action. I was a social worker for five years, and all you do is ask about medications, and you don't solve anything. Yeah. The the funny thing about our the capitalist system is it's a. Uh, it's um, it puts sort of a profit motive above beauty, and you notice when you see certain cities, especially in the old days, where like buildings used to be beautiful, yeah. and uh, now they're just like boxes. They throw a kid up, and it's just for all profit margin. It's um, it's the illusion of permanence that uh, you know, it's like oh, let me get as much money as I can. You're like, yeah, you know, my dad used to say, you know, everyone, it's a cliche, but you can't take it with you. So it's kind of it's it's comical to me. That we're here trying to get this infinite amount, like that we're climbing. It's like it's Sisyphus. We're all trying to climb this hill, but I mean, the rock's gonna fall on us. So I think that's a healthy outlook. Yeah. My dad always used to say before he passed, you know, he would say, you can't, you have to survive not only physically, but you have to survive emotionally. I think a lot of people forget about the emotional part of uh, survival. You have to survive emotionally and humor and, and, and uh, understanding reality in its objective context helps with that. Accepting reality as this, ephemeral uh thing that you're in really just a part of but not as significant as your ego wants you to believe is a is a start that's a good foundation for surviving emotionally what well, what's that mean surviving emotionally like what what's an ideal life look you like for you yeah, you can't surviving you can't take things too seriously you can't um because they're ephemeral they're they're not permanent nothing's permanent your bank account's not permanent your problems aren't permanent uh, nothing's permanent. Your abilities aren't permanent. Um, your memory's not permanent. Your 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 dick getting hard is not permanent. Can I curse on this, or is this go out to jail? <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, you, you can curse to your heart's content. Okay, yeah. I mean, gender's not even permanent anymore. I think I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna change maybe and live my second half as another gender just to have. I'm bored with this gender, so well, it's like nothing is permanent. 
And so accepting that emotionally uh, is a good start to being more flexible. You got to be flexible. Like uh, you know, my dad used to say, anything too stiff snaps. You got to, you know, it's a cliche and people have said it a bunch of different ways, but Bruce Lee's right, man. Be water, be water. <laughs> <laughs> love my dad my dad i would say my dad was my my hero he was just uh my dad really embodied those values and i think um for better or worse it's made me who i am he's he uh my dad was was a painter he was a lawyer he was a uh, he was a uh, you know a lieutenant in the military he new yorker was new yorker born and bred brooklyn his dad his dad you know a surprise owned a diner so that's <laughs> that's sort of the greek passport uh, that's the immigration passport for greeks into america and um, yeah, my dad played football. He just, my dad did what he wanted. He lived as he wanted at all costs. And I think I got that from him for better or worse. I think it's hurt me in my pursuits. Uh, if, if you consider money and fame uh, to be paramount, you know, I, I've always done what I wanted. If I stop wanting to do it, I just stopped doing it. And I think I got that from my dad. So maybe for better or worse, that's what I learned from him. But that's a real currency, you know, feeling like you're in love with what you're doing when you're doing it. Maybe perhaps that's worth more than money. I don't know. You miss him? Yeah, every day, every day. But I'm happy that uh, he he got 91 years. It's Good very run. rare. I mean, he smoked for 60 years. Talk about like a guy who was an outlier. I mean, he smoked like 60 years, like packs. I mean, yeah. and he didn't die from that. He died, he had uh, prostate cancer, which is the way men should go. Your dick should give out. It should start from the dick. I mean, we focus so much of our life on the dick yeah. that that's the way, that's a successful life. And that's why every man eventually gets prostate cancer because that is the universe's way of saying like, the thing you focused on the most is, you put the most energy into is the thing that's spent. <laughs> and it's gonna, your, your <laughs> rotting is gonna start there. So that's a successful life. <sighs> and it just spread all over his body and he slowly died. I was with him when he died and that meant a lot to me because me and my brother weren't talking at the time because we're Greeks. Oh, uh, uh, we're we're talking again, but that's how it is. You got a few brothers, right? I got two brothers, but I wanted to make sure I was with him uh, when he died, and I got lucky, and I was in the room with him when he died. You were in the room with your brother, and you weren't. No, my brother wasn't there. We were kind of doing shifts. I was I was there. I spent the night. The dad, my the the night my dad died. He died in the early in the morning, and I heard the the death rattle, the last breath, and it was just. I think it was. Uh, I he knew I was there, and uh, I think that just probably meant something to him and I'm just glad I was there. I think it I think the actual if there is a point to life it's to um hopefully not fear death, to accept reality. I think that's important. I think so much goes awry in the human condition when we lose touch with reality. Every uh political system that's led to mass murder and everything, I think because it's because the the tenets of those political philosophies ended up being utopian. They were detached from reality, detached from nature. And so I think it's, in, it's very important to accept and acknowledge your own mortality. I think it's the foundation for what makes a good person, a moral person, um, a contributing member of society, because it's true. True things should be the foundation of all things. If, I, if, if, if what you believe is based on illusion, you're gonna end up doing destruction. Whether that destruction's on a scale of one to 10, you are going to be destructive because it's not real. It's a fantasy, it doesn't exist. His mom wasn't hot though, I mean. Or he wasn't Greek, because apparently Oedipal, we, we, found, we found that all things good and bad, yeah. <laughs> He's, yeah, I mean, you know, he's caused a little bit of strife. He's left a little, uh, yeah, he's left a little confusion in his wake, for sure. <laughs> but I mean, you know, that's another one. Separate the art from the artist. He's got, I mean, the guys will go down in history as the greatest. He's made, I mean, a movie a year, and they're all, you can always find something good about each movie, like the dialogue or whatever. Um, I love what you're saying. It's interesting. But the only thing I would say to push back a little bit, since we're playing a little table tennis here, yeah. is... um. I don't know if it's a choice to fear death. That's more of an, it seems more instinctual. It seems like something that nature wants you to do because I've been in positions where I thought I was gonna die, like I've been shot and I had those moments. And then nature also, uh, you know, kicks in an instinct, which is acceptance, 
where you kind of, uh, I don't know, it's a chemical release or whatever. I don't know, you know, <laughs> we're all, we're robots basically. So yeah. some sort of chemical is released that protects you, but there is an acceptance. I don't know how much uh, of it was a conscious choice, probably very little. Um, and that's the point I'm making is it's it's instinctual. We don't really have a choice in fearing death. Otherwise there would be no progression. We wouldn't, all life seems to want to survive, uh, not by choice, but by instinct. <sighs> Maybe that's what gives everything meaning. Yeah. Because if everything lasted forever, if uh, if this went on ad infinitum, there would be no meaning to it. I'd be like, hey, if I don't see you tomorrow, I'll see you in a million years. Yeah. There would be no meaning. There'd be no urgency. There would be no feelings. There'd be no uh, nothing of magnitude or superficiality. It would all just be this kind of, it would be torture. It would actually, that would actually be torture to be here forever. I mean, I'm already sick of this place and I'm just in my forties, <laughs> like I'm done. Yeah, I'm know. sick of me. I'm sick of everything. <laughs> It'll be like a Greek kafania, just sitting around <laughs> drinking coffee, watching. Yeah. I love it. Yeah, <laughs> I mean it's a lazy just man's a... paradise. Yeah. He works hard. Um, yeah, yeah he I does. mean that sounds actually like heaven, dude. That's speaking of my heart, really. I mean, <laughs> I'm at heart. I'm a very lazy person. I always. Tr try to find ways to lie down. Like if I'm sitting, I'll figure out a way to kind of contort myself to lay down. That's an interesting thing to like in, yeah. If you can always push something off. Yeah, that I like that. I, I, I think that's heaven. And- um, See, we, we just changed your mind. You kind of like the mortality. Yeah, I kind of like it. No, so there'll be no thirsts. No, you can always put it off. Hey, I wanna, I wanna, I wanna have, I wanna bang this girl. You're like, I'll put it off. But now I'm thinking about Muslim heaven and they may be offering the best deal. I mean, if it was an expo and they had a booth, I may go with them because they offer they offer 62 or 72, but then I'd get sick of them. I'd want to, I don't know. I always wondered like, are you given the 62 virgins or do you choose, can you create them like an avatar, like a video game? Or are you just given? Greeks have an ancient uh, ancient expression, pot metro stone, which my mother always used to say, which is everything in moderation, nothing in excess. So try and always get the status quo. And uh, yeah, that many women, you, eventually it's like the Magic Johnson effect, Isaiah Thomas effect. You, it's just too much. And you're going to end up, you're going to end up banging a dude is what I'm saying. You're going to get sick of it because it's too much. And one, there's going to be a eunuch that finds its way into your harem. Yeah. That's been proven throughout history, every empire, when you have all that power, and again, this goes back to power corrupting. Yeah. If you have, if there's no struggle, there's no meaning, there's, the value is from the journey, the, yeah. the working hard, the struggle. And if it's just given to you because you're a sultan or you're Alexander the Great or whatever, you're gonna get bored and you're gonna bang a dude. That's, it's, I think that's a scientific axiom actually. Eventually you'll yeah. get bored and bang a dude. Can I ask you a quick question? If yes. you uh, if you live in a small, I come from small islands, right? And so there's a stereotype that that's where they bang animals. But if you come from a very small community, <laughs> yes, you know, an island or something, and you have the choice of banging a family member or an animal, which one is worse on the moral scale? Because uh, you're technically not related to the animal. Okay. It's good to know where you stand on that. I think your viewers, you know, that if they didn't have, they didn't know they had that question. I, they just learned a little bit about you, and now I know. Is that the Turing test? The way you try to—is that what they call it? Where you're trying to, uh, uh, it see if a AI can think like a human or whatever, or feel like a human. We protect uh, dogs. There's laws, there's actual legislation that protects dogs For in torture. certain places, yeah. And you know what, dogs is something I don't think people really understand enough about. It's one of my obsessions, so um, they, they, my dad always used to say, those, he goes, those, those things are basically human. And I mean, they dream, they have anxiety, uh, and what people often overlook about dogs is without dogs, we wouldn't be here. We would not have ever evolved from hunter gatherer to agrarian to you know um, civilization, we wouldn't have cities, we wouldn't have anything. I mean, they are our partner in survival, and they are a magical animal. There's no, 
there's no animal that was, it was like destiny almost. Mm -hmm. I mean, a malleable animal. There's no animal that's that malleable that in a few generations you can tailor to a specific job that you need. And without that animal, without dogs doing that animal, protecting our crops from, from uh, you know, uh, scavengers and stuff like that, you know, the list goes on, we wouldn't be here. So we, that's an often overlooked fact that human evolution was not uh, done in a vacuum just with humans. I mean, without dogs, we would have never evolved. I mean, we weren't the apex predator for most of our existence. We weren't even the apex predator. I mean, we're getting eaten by hyenas, which is my favorite animal. Um, and, you know, that's kind of an injustice. To, I mean, I'm kind of mad at dogs. That I, we deserve to get eaten by hyenas. But without <laughs> dogs, we wouldn't be here. And dogs, dogs deserve the protection. So do horses. They fucking lugged us around for thousands of years. And now these fucking German psychopaths are eating them or whatever. We should not eat horse meat just on like, be a good dude, man. These things lugged us around for generations. Yeah. They're beautiful. You know, ride them or I don't know. I don't know. But I, it, it rubs me the wrong way that we eat horses. Yeah, I mean, if it wasn't for them, uh, we, they're the ones, they were our first alarm system for predators. They would defend us. I mean, the Basenji is one of the most ancient dogs. I mean, they're tiny, but they're fearless. Yeah. And they would chase off lions. Like, you know, there'd be packs of them and they'd chase off lions and protect the tribes. It's, 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 I even get tingles like thinking about dogs because I, I have a dog. I love my dog. It's just, and there's something about when you're walking with your dog off leash in the woods, it like, there's something about it that's like that tugs at that uh, millions of years of evolution like that gut you know it's yeah. like i had a, a finnish friend of mine he's a comic tommy valamis once told me he was like uh he was like the gut he's like i, I believe in that like that gut you know when you have that feeling he's like always trust that because that is million those are all your ancestors that's the survival instinct of all your ancestors at the beginning of time you know, telling you like, hey, something's off here. Something's, you know, so don't get in the car with Ted Bundy is what I'm saying, ladies. How fucking <laughs> stupid. How, who, how can you fall for that? You know, he's got a fucking sling on. Don't get in. You should be because, you know what? People are always scared of robots, but I, I actually, uh, I have, I've made the sort of, uh, I, I, I've made the decision. Hey, I've, I thought about it. I'm like robot, robots have been nothing but helpful. Okay. It's the people we should be scared of. Right. Again, we're kind of missing the most destructive thing is us. Because, But robots are helpful. I mean, this is a fucking robot. Mm -hmm. You know, I went on a hotel tonight. I I'm already booked up. You know, I got my, I can change my flight. If, if this barbecue with Rogan goes 16 hours, which whatever Rogan wants to do, I'll do. If he wants to kick me in the chest, I'll let him kick me in the chest, whatever. Yeah. Um, robots are helpful, no? They keep rodents away. The domesticated cat is very important. It keeps rodents away. Yeah, that's what they were domesticated for. I mean, they're psychopathic killers who end up killing uh, innocent um, neighborhood chipmunks and yeah. and birds. Uh, they really affect the uh, the balance of the local ecosystem. But if so you, you have keep love a, for cats too, not as much as dogs. I mean, yeah. dogs are like you said. They look at humans. I, I actually read an article there. Some people were theorizing they're smarter than chimps because of the way they can work with humans. And there was one border collie that spoke like three hundred words, like a quarter, like a lang, yeah. almost part of the language. And their nose is like a mat. I mean, that's like magic, dude. If you can smell in my ass to what I had for breakfast from miles away. That's intelligence. That's intelligence. I mean, in some ways that their nose, if you were to put it on a scale, maybe their nose is more intelligent than our brain for what it does. You know, it's like, I mean, dude, they can smell you from miles away. You ever see a dog just like sniffing, catching? I mean, it's smelling like, I don't remember the, the, the date on it, but it's like they have like millions of receptors or something where we only, you know, thank God we, we don't have their nose. That would be, that would make sex weird. <laughs> be a little too intense the thing is is i don't know if that if history tells that story it's like i said you look at greece you look at rome democracy kind of failed the majority of rome the uh, the most successful empire uh that we've had um was a dictatorship for most of its run so um but I do believe in a republic, which is sort of a limited democracy. I do believe in in what we have here. I believe in common law. I believe, um, you know, in individual rights. Um, but yeah, I think you said it. I, you, I couldn't. Have, nobody could have said it better. Yeah, it's a it's a short term solution. You look at Saddam Hussein. 
he kind of, you know, when when we took took him out, then there was a lot of infighting that that happened that he was kind of keeping at bay um, because uh, he was a strong man, dictator. Or that could have been the initial subterfuge to kind of get everybody. You know, Hitler also is a you know champion of the people. Let's build some new roads. It's yeah. what psychopaths do, and that's why it's interesting to me. I'm not sure if power corrupts psychopaths. And now that we know that we can do these CAT scans and brain scans, again, we know that they're born that way. Power definitely corrupts people who have the capacity uh, to feel and, and for empathy. Power, I'm not sure. I don't think power corrupts people who were born uh, psychopathic with that condition or sociopaths who had, who, who you know, who were closer to psychopath and then had some traumatic life you know, I just think, um, you know, the best way to get away with whatever nefarious thing you want to do to feel, I guess the only thing psychopaths can feel is that excitement, is to pretend to be the opposite of what you are. Yeah. That's what that's what killers do. That's what the worst people do. Look at Bill Cosby. I mean, he was, what better way to hide, you know? It's like what wokeness is now. It's like, I'm such a great person. And they, you're like, are you? It's a great, the best way to hide is to pretend to be the opposite of what you are, just like Ted Bundy. I'm, I'm just an innocent, helpful guy. And then boom, next thing you know, you, you, you're getting your tip bit off. Yeah, especially if you're a New Yorker, we don't trust any. The nicer you are, the more skeptical we are. Yeah. I've struggled with that down here. I've been like, what, what's your angle? And they're like, nah, dude, just, I wanted to show you the best tacos, man. And I'm like, did you really, what do you want? Because in New York, it's like if anyone's nice to you, they want something. Yeah, and that's uh, a <laughs> that's a, the the pro side to that is it makes you very street smart. The downside to that is it makes you way too cynical. Lions are predictable. Lions are just you know they're regal and kind of they bore me. It's like the hot chick. It's like we get it. You were born the best. Yeah, you know I like a scrappy by any means necessary, intelligent and cunning. Uh, but aren't they dishonest? Yeah, and that's why I <laughs> like them. Yes, they're dishonest, they employ uh, chicanery, yeah. they, uh, they're, and that's just a sign of how intelligent they are and how self-reliant they are and how brutal they are. Um, they're brutally honest in how much they lie. Yeah, you know, because it's just they're trying to get the job done. Yeah. You know, lions are just like they're they're too gifted. Everyone hates the fucking. You know, if I went to school with you, I'd be like, of course, Lex knows the fucking answer. Yeah. Lex was born smarter than me. Yeah, you know, and you'd probably hate me because uh, I was the kid always seeking attention and making people. It's like that's not interesting. The guy that claws his way to the top, and those are hyenas. They're also fascinating just by uh, merely who they are. I mean, they're not related to any other animal. They're c more closely related to cats than they are dogs, even though they look oh, more like a dog. Yeah, they're, but they're very, like very tangentially related even to cats. So they're their own kind of thing, which is kind of mysterious. I don't think they fully figured out. And uh, they, the pseudo penis thing is the, is the I mean, it is Can the Can you talk explain the pseudo penis? I... Yeah, so the, it's a <laughs> matriarchal society, by the yeah. way. So that's the unique in and of itself that this, we're talking about an apex predator that is uh, matriarchal, much like, uh, you know, the praying mantis. It's very rare though. And they are fucking brutal and vicious. And the women are bigger and they let their cubs fight, a lot of fratricide. And they do that because they're like, hey, you're weaker. They let, I let your brother kill you. And uh, the women have penises. The women have pseudo penises that they give birth out of. And the birth is violent, but they they roll around with just f huge pieces. Their glue guns are just fucking swinging, yeah. you know? And the women are just run the show. And uh, it's just cool that they have these pseudo penises. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's almost romantic the way you describe it. They have it. the strongest bite force. They uh, they pulverize bone. Like when they eat an animal, the animal's gone. There's no bones. They eat everything. They can pulverize. Their bite is so powerful. They pulverize bone and eat it. So if they consume an animal, it the animal was there, and then the animal's gone. There's no nothing for the vultures there to uh, to 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 grab. They're usually yeah. portrayed as like, uh, it, it's really sad that they're portrayed that way in lions. Like lions aren't dicks. Lions are dicks. They, the, 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 
the alpha lions will kill the cubs of another rival they do all types of dick shit yeah and um yeah it's uh, the hy- hyenas are more interesting like they'll just roll in like a hyena will like like you said the lie you know because when you watch the serengeti you know animals will hang out with each other they're like by water so one hyena will just kind of roll in and pretend like it's not hungry and then bang They'll use any means necessary to take an animal down. Like yeah. lions will just use brute strength. Hyenas use cunning. And you can even go on the internet and find uh, memes of this where hyenas will grab the big animal by the balls and just like will sneak up behind it and bite its balls. And you'll watch an animal 10 size, ten times the size of the hyena just slowly go down. It's brutal, but it's fucking hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> important to acknowledge i think because that it's real and we do come from that we are we evolve from that it's important we still do that we're just hidden from it you know when you go to the supermarket and get your slab of meat and you know you're so disconnected from where that meat came from it came from that and often that's uglier to watch than because there's some honesty you know the the the, the nature channels only show uh, that's why we have so much sympathy with the prey. And this is where I think, the same thing with mafia movies. They don't show what the mafia really does. They glorify the good parts. That's why I like State of Grace because it's really just shaking down old people and fucking being dicks. <laughs> it's not driving nice yeah. cars and being like, you know. So, and and animal channels do the same thing. They only show when the cheetah gets it because that's that's the exciting part. But what most people don't know is that those predators strike out almost always. A majority of the time, the prey wins. And so if you saw that and put it in context, you might not hate it as much when the predator actually gets the little fawn or whatever, because it's so many fawns got away. It's so hard to capture your prey. And, you know, we, we don't have the, 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 they, no, no documentary is going to sit around and show you the yeah. 99 times the cheetah uh, didn't Let's catch. Back. Put some respect the, the, on the, Ted Bundy's name. Yeah, the, it's the, not easy to convince somebody to get in your Volkswagen Beagle and, and the then, cleanup. And then you, you have to kind of plan ahead because you want to keep doing the murder, mass murder. You got to learn how to saw them up, put them in duffel bags, bury. You got to learn how to dig. You got to learn how to hide. You got to learn to lie. I mean, it's a lot that goes into it. Yeah, that we need to put a little respect on. Yeah. This is one of the closest things to me because my mother was actually on the island of Crete during this. The first aerial invasion in history. A lot of people don't know that. So this is a very significant battle. Um, first time there was an invasion from the sky. Um, and uh, my mother was a little girl and she lived through four years of uh, Nazi occupation there. So my mother was a human rights lawyer and everything, but she just always hated Germans. It's just what it is. She hated Germans and, and she never got over it. So the most progressive, open-minded woman just could not get over this. Um, it's a monumental battle that a lot of historians in retrospect have now looked back on and said, because the Nazis, first off, you got to take it back to when Hitler instructed Mussolini, because let's be honest, Mussolini was Hitler's bitch. You know what I mean? It was like, if it was, you know, if it was fantasy Island, Hitler was the fucking, and the, and Mussolini was boss of the plane. Mussolini ever say no to Hitler or even maybe it's always like, yes. Yes, uh, yeah. <laughs> yes, we will do it. And uh, it's like, yeah, take, you have to take Greece. And so, um, yeah. So Italy being uh, much bigger than Greece. Greece is a tiny country, nine, yeah. 10 million. So Italy invaded Greece, um, you know, um, and Aki Day is a big, it's a big holiday for Greeks. And this speaks to the spirit. Greeks in fight until we have a common enemy and then we unite. You see it throughout history, Sparta and Athens. You see it in Greek families <laughs> where the brothers will fight. But then as soon as we have a common enemy, we unite. And maybe it's an overactive brain. We think too much, our, our traditions, philosophy, and we overthink things and we fight with each other and take things personally. We're all so passionate. But when Italy said, hey, we're going to move troops through, you know, uh, a Greek said Aki, which means no. And that was, um, and then Italy attacked. And uh, we beat the shit out of them. A much bigger country, much uh, more well-equipped country. Greece beat the shit out of them, kicked them back into Albania, actually not only repelled them, actually like conquered some ground in Albania, pushed them back. And then Hitler was like, fuck, you know, I was planning my march to Russia. 
uh, but I have to go down because he basically said to Mussolini, like, you know, you fu- he basically bitch slapped him, like Fredo, <laughs> like I got to do this myself because yeah. you're such a fucking bitch. Yeah. So then the Nazis invaded Greece. Obviously, they took the mainland with fight and shot out. The Greeks never give credit to the British and New Zealand and Australian troops that were there. You know, they were a large part of this, the majority of it. But the Greeks fight, dude, civilians. I mean, they fought. You know, the Ottomans were there 400 years. You go to Greece now, there's no evidence. There's virtually no evidence of them ever being there. That's the Greek spirit. Kick them out, and we kicked out hummus too. So it's like your culture's <laughs> gone, you're gone. Because yeah. Greeks are, uh, it's philoptimo. It's called philoptimo, and it's a real thing. Philoptimo is a, there's very little, trans, you can't translate it, but it's kind of like honor, loyalty, friendship, uh, altruism, it's, uh, it's, you can't define it, but Greeks know it and we're taught it from our, from our uh, families. It's a vibe, man. It's a Greek cultural thing and we're an old culture and philoptimo is what it's called, philoptimo. And it's, um, it's love, it's passion, and it comes out and it comes out. And so, um, so Hitler had to postpone his invasion of, um, of uh, Russia, went down the island of Crete, took 10 days to conquer. It's an island. Mm -hmm. To put that in perspective, the country of France fell in three or four days. I can't even remember because they fucking just rolled over. So what what, what does a couple hours matter when you're that much of a fucking pussy? Yeah. Okay? (laughs) What does a couple hours, 12 hours, fucking three or four days? Uh, The island of Crete took the Germans 10 days to conquer. And because of that, and because of the Greek resistance, Hitler had to postpone his invasion of Russia to winter. And of course that was, you know, that was his downfall just as it was Napoleon's. And uh, never, dude, never try to invade Russia. They got millions of people to throw at death. Every time you read about Russians in history books, like, and a million died. I mean, it's like, you just guys throw millions of people at the problem and don't fuck with that Russian winner and don't fuck with Russian people, dude, they're tough. People in New York know that. You don't go to fucking Sheepset Bay and start talking shit. You'll end up in a fucking car trunk and they'll brutally murder you. I do not fuck with Russians. Yeah, that- Likewise, the Americans don't hear about the Soviet contribution to the end of World War II because obviously we became, you know, enemies after that because of the two systems. But yeah, without the Russians, World War II wouldn't have been won either. I'll tell you what's missing that I know for a fact. Because my dad told my dad uh, told me combat's hell, and he would tell me the reality of what it's really like. Guys pissing themselves, calling for their mother. The the fog of war, obviously, fratricide happens all the time. It's pandemonium. I mean, there's skill involved, but I mean, there's no like. It's a lot of it is just luck. My dad said he. My dad won three. He got you know medals, bra- uh, purple hearts, all that shit. And he said the reason was is because he can't. He always said this. Is another thing he told me: you can't pin a medal on a dead guy. So he's like, those are the guys who deserve it, but you can't pin a medal. You can't do the pomp yeah. and with and um i'll tell you one thing is that uh it is written by the victors and all these leaders they say were in the front were not in the front we're not le- whenever the history books say he led his troops into battle it's like did he really hmm. did he yeah. so then how did he live because they put like kids in the front you know it's like nobody limps back from the front with like a injury you know that's that's army pr it, you know whenever you read uh, you know, uh, 27 soldiers died, 14 were injured. The, the word injured is PR. That's like injured, was he? Did he sprain his ankle? <laughs> did he need, yeah, did he get carried off the court? Or, you know, he was maimed. I mean, yeah. he was like, his leg was blown off. You know, it's like, yeah. so uh, I think that, you know, Alexander the Great was just kind of in the back on his horse and just kind of, <laughs> he had his eunuch blow him a few times and he was like, is it bad up there? And then like after the, he was like, okay, when, my scribe, give me my scribe. Okay, when you write this down, can you put me in the front? Yeah. And I was just, make me a big hero. And I was in there and then he, you know, he just blew his, you know, he had sex with his eunuch and rode off into the sunset because there's just no way you survive in the front, especially warfare back then. I mean, it's like brutal. My scribe, yeah, it's all lore. I mean, you ever play the game of telephone? You know, it's like, you know, there's no video cameras back then. So shit just get turns into myth, you know? And uh, there's no way he was in the front. There's no way he wouldn't have lived. You know, he was probably good on horseback because those those dudes were good on horseback. The, it was like Game of Thrones back then. You had all these different people and they kind of, yeah, the, 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 the Mongols were wild, dude. They are actually said like... Um, they started like they were more adaptable to the horse because they were so good on horseback that 
kids start to be born like kind of bow-legged like yeah. to fit the horse. it's wild and they would stretch their heads and shit like that they'd wrap them and stretch their heads so they find like mongol skulls and the, they look like cone heads and they were brutal and vicious and they would maraud and rape and all the fun stuff that <laughs> you know when you know when you visit other places back then there's no tchotchke stops and souvenir shops what you do is you take women and those are the tokens you know you burn a few huts Different. Tourism was different back then. <laughs> <laughs> but do you think also that it's that effect that we were, a lot of good things had to happen too, or else we wouldn't be here. So yeah. do we just focus, isn't it like a car crash effect that like we're, just, you know, the, the rubber neck that everyone pulls over to see a car crash? Are we just only focusing on the negative things of history because they're just more exciting to us? Like, it's just not, it's boring to be like, yeah, and then there was a bunch of villagers and they ate every day and danced and um. yeah i mean yeah. greece you look at the architecture it still stands up i mean all the government but it's still arguably i mean as far as objective beauty it's hard to argue that greco-roman it's just something about it with the with the columns it's just it's powerful it's i don't know even ayn rand would probably appreciate it mm. You know Leopold and Loeb? You know the story of those two? Uh, they murdered that kid and they had this weird relationship. Uh, anyway, it's an interesting thing to Google, Leopold and Loeb, these two guys who ended up murdering a kid because they developed their own language with each other and uh, this own reality and this weird thing. And they wanted to know what it's like to murder a kid and they murder a kid. It's a famous story in American lore and history or whatever. Famous case. Um, but this phenomenon, yeah, me and Chris got together. I, th I, it wasn't as dark as Leopold Loeb. We didn't murder yeah. a kid, but uh, we murdered a podcast. Um, <laughs> <laughs> or at least stabbed it a few times. Yeah, it's um, it was something in the organic chemistry of me and Chris that I think we'll both end up uh, appreciating even probably more than we do now that uh, it's mysterious. I got to be honest with you, it's... um. It was a thing that uh, it wasn't conscious, uh, wasn't intentional. It was something that happened in the music of our energies yeah. that just went. It's fascinating. Like when you hear someone sing or uh, when a jazz band hits a rhythm or even when I'm on stage and I just catch a rhythm, it's like, D -d dude, I didn't make a choice there. I don't know what that is. I don't know how to explain it, but it comes from somewhere else. And uh, I don't know what it is. It's beyond my comprehension, but with Chris... Uh, there was this magical chemistry that, uh, you know, I have chemistry with a lot of people and uh, it can be funny and I enjoy I feel zero chemistry here. No, this is great. This oh, is great. <laughs> yeah, it's a little bit more intelligent than what me and Chris did. Uh, but, you know, uh, me and Chris, uh, I think we connected in, in a, in a, on, a, on the funny bone. Like I, I, he, I found him so funny and we found the same things funny. And from that, these organic expressions came from the, some part of our brains that was created from this chemistry. And yeah, we just developed this in language and this cult following and people were really upset when we ended, but it was the right thing to end because like all things that end, it was kind of done a few episodes even before we finished. And mm -hmm. I think we pulled the plug before it started rolling downhill. Like all, uh, you know, like all great flings, you know, there's your long relation, long marriages are boring and comfortable. The one you really like fucking yeah. always ends abruptly and sadly and uh but you always look back and you jerk off to it yeah. and uh but so you, so you guys made love we made yeah so it's like it was like a hot fling mm -hmm. with me and him and it was intense mm -hmm. and we burned the candle at both ends and it was i think that podcast was meant to be three years and um maybe people will go back and appreciate it and listen to it over and over again. And I think the new things we do, people will love. I, I, I'm doing long days now, that podcast, and people yeah. seem to enjoy it. And I'll tell you, man, I'll just emphasize it because I marvel at it too. Because um, as a guy who tries to always figure out uh, what the causes of things, I got to be honest, man, looking back on that, even with retrospective wisdom, you know, that 2020 hindsight, we've been done a couple months now. It's um, it's something that I can't explain. Yeah, it's something that I don't know how you quantify it. I don't know how you describe it. It's it's musical. It's really kind of rhythmic. So, could be. Yeah, it could be. 
Yeah. But uh, it's definitely a classic podcast that people can go back and appreciate. It's fast paced and it was unique. Exactly true. Uh, we were we were uh, one uh, fan. We attracted such funny people to that podcast, and the fans were so funny. And one fan called us, nicknamed us Wikipedia sluts. <laughs> and so it just stuck. Yeah, we just would read Wikipedia. I would do a lot more research than Chris. Yeah. And uh, so I would actually, uh, you know, once in a while he'd, he'd get into it too. But for very interesting episodes, I got I got some 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 subject matter would just pull me in. Yeah. Like Bernie Madoff, just to think of one that was recent. It was one of our last ones. And I think one of our better episodes. And I'm glad that uh, it kind of ended after that because it was rare. to. I think we started to slip a little bit. Um, I got fascinated and I got, I did a lot of research for Bernie Madoff, but usually, yeah, we'd pull up Wikipedia and we'd have fun. We were sort of the antithesis of Dan Carlin. I mean, you went to Dan Carlin for uh, accuracy and, and thoughtfulness and you went to us for, it was a hang with history. Was, that's why History Hyenas was such an appropriate name because it was, it was <laughs> a little bit of history. Some, some episodes were more hyena, yeah. more wild. And a little history, and some were a little more dense, like the Battle of Crete, and less hyena. So it, you were you were always going to get both. <laughs> you were either going to get a majority of one or the other. More of the latter. I wasn't even aware of his podcast when we started. Oh, interesting. Yeah, and uh, so we it was just very organic. Again, like the chemistry. Me and Chris became very good friends. We started the podcast first. We did a web series called Bay Ridge Boys, which. Mm -hmm has its sort of little cult following. We did like five episodes and ended it. Um, and then we did the podcast. And uh, hyenas were my favorite animal. And I talk about them passionately. And I told Chris about them. And then he started appreciating them. And we both love history. I majored in history. It's one of the things I love. I go to museums all the time. I go to hist I do history tours. So does he. And so it was just sort of a natural, let's do a history podcast. And it gave us something to talk about each episode to sort of lean our, you know, hang our hats on and, and riff off of. So it had nothing to do with Dan's. What I think about Dan's, I think it's great. I think even if he's inaccurate uh, in the opinions uh, of the historical community, it starts conversations, which is good. It's like this thing where people go, oh, it's dangerous rhetoric. It's like, no, rhetoric only becomes dangerous when education fails. What's going on in America is education has failed. So if you call someone online dangerous, it's not him that's dangerous. It's the fucking stupid people that's dangerous. And it's the fault of this country. We didn't listen to Aristotle. The future of a civilization <laughs> depends on public education. Yeah. And we failed. Education has failed. Kids are kids are not interested in shit. And um I think often it inspires you to go learn more. Learn so it's like, more. I know we did that. I mean, you know, I people would go, hey, I went and learned about this because they knew with us there was no pretense, which was great, that we had no standard. So it's like nobody came to us for historical accuracy. But I was kind of turned on by the fact that it inspired people to go learn about this mm -hmm. stuff or to at least know, like Battle of Crete, like you said, a very underappreciated battle. Um, even Winston Churchill said, uh, from here on, we will no longer say that uh, Greeks fight like heroes, but heroes fight like Greeks. I mean, it was a monumental battle and, um, you know, not talked about enough. And I, it, it, our podcast would inspire people to go actually learn more, to go listen to Dan Carlin or to go pick up a book or to do research on their own. And so I think podcasts, Dan Carlin's obviously much more accurate than us, but it's good that people are going to podcasts like yours and to, to learn shit. Joe was is really like, the progenitor of that. I mean, you know, having intellectuals on and getting the public interested with this new medium um, in in people who are intelligent. It's mm -hmm. nice because, yeah. you know, what the mainstream press pushes out is horseshit, gorgeous horseshit. <laughs> it's got a beautiful veneer, but no substance. And so this, this is a nice pushback. Bertie Madoff is the Goat, the greatest thief of all time, dude. Um, hedge fund guy ran a hedge fund and uh, pulled a, stole the most money in the history of America. I mean, a con artist, and um, he does. People obviously, he's become he's a household name because of the magnitude of his crime. But you got to appreciate again. You got to appreciate what went into this and how long he was able to pull it off uh, by tricking the smartest and richest people in the world. And a brilliant scam. The con man, uh, con man is 
short for confidence man. And it, it came from, yeah, a con man, basically they, they exude confidence and they trick people by playing on their ego and, and blind spots. And it, uh, the, the word comes from a guy, I can't remember where, but what he, what he used to do, I, I can't remember the guy's name, I, you know, whatever. You can Google it, con man. But it's very interesting. The, the first con man that is on record, what he would do, he would go to very rich people and he'd be very well dressed, right? And he'd go, he'd say, I bet you, you you don't have the confidence to give me your watch. Mm -hmm. And he would plan the egos of these very powerful and rich people and they would give him the watch for some reason, some sort of reverse psychology bullshit. And he'd take the watch and he would just steal it. <laughs> so, because basically saying like, I don't, you don't have the confidence to give me the watch because you don't, I don't know, you don't think I'm gonna give it back. And he would just take it. Yeah. So Bernie Madoff was a very sophisticated, sophisticated con man. And again, we were talking about people pretending to be the opposite of what they are. Bernie hid his uh, thievery in how available he was to his clients, how he would show up at every bar mitzvah, every birthday. He was always available for their phone calls. And he uh, played on their egos. He made it so people were wanted to invest in him. Mm -hmm. Like they were competing. He made it very exclusive. He, he wouldn't just take anyone. And there was a method behind that madness because he wanted the whales that wouldn't notice that he was he was had this pyramid scheme going. And so what he would do is he would just rob from the richer and he just kept, it was like he'd pay back the richer with the guy who was a little less, and it was a pyramid scheme. And um, he was able to do it for so long and steal so much money. And he would win people over with the scheme because with that scheme, he was the only guy who could provide, who could guarantee like a 1% return, even during times of recession. And because he was such a good con man, he hijacked people's reasoning with his charm. Yeah. And that's what con artists do. That's what psychopaths do. They're so fucking charming. Yeah. They get you in that Volkswagen Beetle because if they use their reasoning for one second, they'd go, hey, Nobody can provide 1% returns during recessions. Yeah. How the fuck is this guy doing it? I'll tell you how he's doing it. He's stealing from another guy to pay you. <laughs> you fucking idiot. So charisma is essential to that. You know, maybe you can help explain something to me, something I have been affected I'm by. I'm way too loud for your listeners. There's going to be comments like, tell this guy to calm down. I'm Just sorry, I'm Greek apostolate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we do. <laughs> People are ridiculous when they think that. Yeah, that's why people get into science for the money. Yeah, right. hey, the personalities that get into science are obsessed with mon minutia and mon they they do the scientific method. You know how boring that is. Yeah. Like you <laughs> have to have a love for it. Yeah, exactly. In order to do it. But the love thing, and truth. Yeah, I mean, look at Hitler. Charisma is, is blinding. I think that's what con men. Speaking of Bernie Madoff, that's one of their major tools is flattery. Just glib, superficial yeah. charm. It creates those blind spots. Yeah. People want to hear how great they are. They want to be flattered. It, it, it takes your defenses down, plays to our ego, the, the the how much we're all just pieces of garbage and want to hear how great we are. We want that love from our mother and our father. It, it's Freudian. And, and they know because they're not burdened with that need, yeah. they're not burdened with that uh, empathy or emotions and they just see things very calculatively um they play they know that we're prey in their game and they use that against us and that is why someone who is not that intelligent like hitler can probably convince a lot more intelligent people you know and that's why we can't give tim dylan power because you know he already stands on a stage i mean if we let that guy i mean he will just take over a country and everyone who can't cook well will be eliminated yeah so it's like um, i wonder why he keeps complimenting me when we're in private exactly be careful he, he looks at me just you're you're i like your suit i like the cut of your jib yeah definitely yeah, you i will be careful of that kid he's hitler <laughs> But it's crazy to think Clip about Clip that, please, <laughs> internet. I mean, but, I mean, Quentin Tarantino said it to bed. I mean, in, in his script, personality goes a long way, dude. Yeah. I mean, personality can, tr can usurp common sense and reason of the smartest people. These absolute smartest people can be hypnotized. It's sort of like a, a sexy woman. It's like um, you can just, it just, you can be tricked because we have such a blind spot for, uh, you know, for, uh, for flattery. Yeah, I mean, you're right, because that's uh, that's the one piece of history we don't have. We don't know. We don't know. We do know that the kid crushed. I mean, he was a headliner. He got up there and his, oh, fucking, his, speech his hair would flop around. I mean, he crushed, dude. 
Especially it's when you endless. give people a scapegoat. Nobody wants to look in, nobody wants to do the work to be better or look at where they messed up. Why does it always have to be the Jews that are the scapegoat? Uh, you know, <laughs> it's like, <laughs> get <laughs> over it, guys. I mean, it's like, you, they killed Jesus, you th- get over it. Yeah. Okay, it's a long time ago. I mean, move on. <laughs> I'm Jewish, I understand, because we do run the central banks and- uh, And the weather. And the weather. Yeah. <laughs> Don't forget about the weather, that's a big one. That's a funny one that people created, like, who gives a shit? Well, what is the weather? Like- What's the importance of the weather? All right, the Jews made it rain outside. Good, you got to fuck, you know, they made it snow. Okay, you get a day off. Thank you, Jew. I'm, uh, I'm not necessarily conspiratorial. Um, nobody cares that much. Um, but they're... <laughs> 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 but then you you know what happens is you find out this one or this two uh and you start questioning everything and you start questioning everything man it's like you know the vietnam war started that was a lie um that was a false flag and then yeah. next thing you know everything's a false flag there are some strange things on 9 11 um you know there's some strange things from a scientific perspective i'm no scientist but it's like you know yeah three steel framed uh skyscrapers falling on the same day in the same way yeah. a lot of people say oh it was the, it, they, they were hit by planes it's like yeah but that's not where they fell they fell because of fires and usually not usually all the time except for three times and there was buildings that have burned for longer than that um yeah it's no good i like andrew <laughs> yang and it's no good i i'd be honest with you i'm a, I'm a lifelong new yorker I mean, I'm a New Yorker. Well, you're a New Yorker, so nothing's good. Well, something is good. Okay. And talking on, let's be honest about New York. Yes. Uh, it's a very socially liberal place. It is the head of the snake. New York is the country. If New York, when New York's not doing good, country's not doing good. Um, it's the most important city, DC, New York. It's really Rome, be honest. It's, it's. Uh, I, maybe I'm biased, I don't know. But no. Yeah. <laughs> We just did New Yorkers. We walk around everywhere and we go, this is just like New York, but not New York. It's, um, <laughs> but and New York needs, and I'm a guy who leans left. I, you know, I just, I lean left and that's just what it is. A dictator? Is that where you're going? No, <laughs> we, we need, back to Stalin we need, it's a money town. Let, let's be, come on, man. I mean, New York is a money town and, uh, Wall Street. And then when AOC and her cronies, um, at the local level, rejected that Amazon thing. You're going like, what do you think makes cities? And what, 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 what's going to create jobs in the 21st century? What do we need? More nail salons? More yeah. pizza places? I mean, we're living in the tech revolution, and you know, whatever your opinions are about Jeff Bezos, that's the world yeah. tech. And they wants to come here. Of course, you give them tax breaks. That's why any companies go anywhere. She's so fucking utopian, and that that progressive wing is so utopian, and that always ends in disaster because it's not rooted in reality. It doesn't ex- accept the reality that people are self-interested. Now they're going to do this 14%, 15% tax hike on people making a million dollars more. In New York City, a million dollars is not that much. Mm-hmm. So people are going to flee New York. The tax base is going to flee. New York's going to fall to shit like it did before. So you're saying it basically needs a more capitalist front, like capitalistic yes. type of thinker. That Bloomberg, em- Giuliani, when he was still sane and his hair wasn't melting off his face. Hmm. Prosecutor, you need a tough... <laughs> I mean, I don't know what's happened. That guy's lost it, but it's fun. Yeah, it's fun to watch. Yeah, it's fun to watch him be just like uh, Trump's lackey. Like, yeah, boy, whatever you want, boss. I'll just say whatever you want, boss. Uh, but New York is a money town that needs a money guy and sort of more of a Republican. I have to say on the local level, as more of a guy who leans left, I'll just be honest. It It's a tough city that needs a tough mayor. Not some guy who's going like, I understand we all need free money, it, you know. Andrew Yang, I think, is right in the big picture because all the real jobs are somewhere else. And you look at those Asian cities, you go like, oh, that's what our cities used to look like at the Industrial Revolution. You know, there was like, there was jobs and people were making things here. And now you look at those cities in Asia and you're going like, wow. And then you go to Detroit and you're like, yeah, we're done. You go to Cleveland, you go, we, we're done. Just so we could actually, you're right. The podcast does make, like I listen, I've been listening to every word you've been saying. And if we weren't doing a podcast, I might be looking at my phone or being self-conscious about something else or nervous. I I knew you were going to lose your train of thought on that one because that's a big one. There's emotion behind that one. A podcast with dad is going to take, that's going to take you to a place. I took you to a place. It took you outside of. 
took you that took you to a place. So uh, uh, Angie Yang mentioned. Do you respect me now, Dad? <laughs> MIT is it enough? It's... Fucking million people listening to this. I got fourteen Rogans. Is it enough, Dad? I'm creating robots. Is it enough for you? It's not enough. <laughs> That's what drives you, probably. Whether they're robot or human, right? Your kids. Most likely, yeah. let's be honest. Robot. You might call one of your robots. You, you love your robot. Are you starting to love your? Is it going to be like that Pygmalion thing? You create them and then they kill you, but even while they're killing you, you got a tear. Yeah, that, that's why I say it. I, that, that's the reality of the situation. Is you know, um, I, I'm all for the public good, but yeah, there needs to be a, back to that Greek expression, "pan metron I, I also think the free market is responsible for progress. I think it's the most natural thing, the thing that's most aligned with human nature, which is self-interest. And um, which I believe, not to the extent that Ayn Rand would, but I do believe people are mostly self-interested, uh, especially with one gun to the head. Um, morals are out the window. You know, it's about survival. So, you know, create a system that respects that and acknowledges that. But socialism works very well, at least right now, as a check, as to temper uh, the excesses of capitalism. And in certain scenarios, is uh, the more appropriate system, you know, in a vacuum. So one being prisons or, you know, uh, you know, uh, governance, uh, you know, uh, mark. Yeah, doctors want boats. <laughs> yeah, it's, so I guess you're voting for AOC, you're saying. Because no, I'm not voting for AOC, but I do. I, it's just a tough one. That's a tough one. But ultimately, the Hippocratic Oath, it's like, how do you turn people away, man? How do you do that to people? It's like, a, it's it's a tough thing to uh, to reconcile helping people, curing people with the uh, the marketplace. It's just, I, I can understand why that one's so tough. And then you got hypochondriacs, of course, who drain the system. You know, like people who are have anxiety, like me, who had COVID and called 14, uh, you know, I called 14 ambulances. So, and then of course we're fat and the free market made us fat because it played, uh, the marketing made us want all this junk food and that's a burden on the healthcare system. So we got to do something about that. We got to get creative. We need new thinkers. I'll be one of them. When you go to a fast food restaurant, you stand on a scale. If you're over a certain thing, you can't be served. It's good for the healthcare system. You know, <laughs> you're just handed a salad and say, sorry, this burger's illegal for it right now. If you achieve these certain oh, uh, BMI goals, <laughs> then you can you can have this burger, but right now you can't. And that's where the state's important. Yeah. Okay. So, to regulate <laughs> our freedoms. No slurpees. I'm with you, Bloomberg. <laughs> Cheap three day work weeks. Why has that? Wait, not happened wait. Yet? Okay. Where are you going with this one, <laughs> dude? Good for the economy. Stimulates the economy. Right. More shifts. Yeah. Creates more jobs. More people spending because they have more leisure time. Boosts the leisure economy. Yeah. You know. Why what, are we still if, doing the five day work week? That that was that was tempered from the seven day work week. That was so the seven. It used to be seven day work week. It used to yeah. be like, and people who are just these libertarians, it's like, come on, dude, what, what what is this fresh? Are we freshmen in college? Yeah, you're gonna you, you, we're gonna talk about Ayn Rand next. Like, let's talk about reality, okay? And human nature. People are fucking greedy. They they lie. They you know, there's no end to up, which is one of my favorite expressions. Um, no so, end to up. No end to up. There's no end to up. Uh, can we dissect that? Yeah. From a Randian perspective? There's no end to up, which is uh, you just keep going. It's never enough. The human oh, never flaw, enough. it's never enough. No end to up. More, more, more. And, you know, you have to reconcile your fact that you're going to die. So, like, this no end to up thing is that balance is, is just as valuable as progress. So, we have to reconcile those two things and put them on a seesaw and figure out how to get two people who have the equal weight to to keep it like that. And that's the goal. And it constantly vacillates uh, according to the time. You, sometimes you need a little more socialism. Sometimes you need a little more capitalism. Mm -hmm. You got to, you got to, you got to fly the plane, man. You got to fly the plane, dude. There's a few, but, uh, you know, Queen Elizabeth, uh, the Elizabethan era, you know, the sun never sets in the British empire. Very successful empire. Uh, what an absolute success story that is for a leader and a woman. Um, 
Can you tell a little bit about her story? Well, you I know, actually don't she, know much about the British. Yeah, she Empire. had a good run. I think it's like seventy years. You know, the Shakespeare. The you know the oh I guess what's the word Pax Romana the the, the a period of Rome that it was at peace and they flourished like a couple of er emperors like Trajan or some good ones and I think he was part of the Pax Romana that sort of just a peace and a comfortable flourishing time and England uh, had sort of that in their empire under her successful reign she murdered her cousin she you know the <laughs> movies there's, there's uh, you know um, Kate Blanchett plays her and and does so. And she didn't win the Oscar because fucking Gwyneth Paltrow put a put a British accent on in Shakespeare in Love. It's a tragedy. Why do I know this? Because I'm not a full man. I'm a comedian, which means I do skits and I perform. Um, and I, I Kate Blanchett's an incredible actress. It's great movies. She was just so. And here's the thing: she she never got married. She was a she was so um, astute at public relations. And, and 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 imagine how strong you got to be as a woman to lead the greatest empire maybe known to man at the time and to do so so successfully. How Machiavellian you have to be, how idealist you have to be, how much of a good marketer you have to be. Propaganda machine was on point. She was married to England. She was adored the way she adorned herself. You walked in, you're like, holy man, a God just walked in here. And of course she got fucked. I mean, who doesn't fuck? We all fuck. Mm -hmm. Even robots one day will fuck. Yeah. But she was she she did that propaganda thing. And and historians aren't uh haven't they haven't decided this, but I believe she fucked. And I believe she did that as a tool of propaganda. I'm married to England. So you uh, oh you you're directly referring to like using sex as a way to manipulate people. Well, she her she was known as like the the virgin queen. Mm -hmm. And uh and her thing was like I'm married to England. Like I can't be distracted by man or woman blah blah blah. She never had any kids, nothing. I think she did that as a tool of manipulation. Yes. Which you need. Uh, rulers need to, you know, Obama made you feel good and then he went and bom carpet bombed everywhere. You need to feel good about your guy, no yeah. matter how evil they are. And she was fucking a dictator. Yeah. But when you look back at her, everyone's like, oh my God, she was so great. The horror and the shit that she had to do, she didn't put that in the history books, but that's what probably was part of what made her successful. And um, she's a fascinating character to, to ponder on because she was so successful and 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 England flourished so much, and uh, it's just fascinating to me because she was the ver great Virgin Queen. And can you think of a? No there's no other woman who was that. Say, I mean, Angela Merkel. I mean, come on. Yeah. I mean, there's nobody who comes close. And defeating the Spanish Armada, I think that happened under her. I mean, I'm no professional historian, but I mean, the the woman crushed. And I think he's a, I don't think he's a relic from another era. I think his background, I think he is who you think he is because his background was in espionage. His background was in subterfuge and espionage. I think I've said the word subterfuge maybe 10 times now, <laughs> but he- uh, You like big words, you're yeah, intellectuals. I just, uh, I'm <laughs> sitting here with you, it's my, it's time to flex. <laughs> um, but he um, he's very good at that, right? Like uh, controlling people with psychology. And even if you look at the way he sort of used the internet, and um, ha has sort of been, you know, gotten into the citizens of other countries' opinions, and it's very KGB. He also looks great without a shirt on a pony, on a horse, on a horse. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I thought he would choose a pony because a pony's smaller, makes him look. Would uh, would you would you put Queen Elizabeth as the greatest leader of all time? Like Probably. You... Yeah, I think as a woman, and you look at uh, you look at the the length of the reign, I think it's like 70 something years or something like that, that she reigned. Success, man, success. She used the church, she used public psychology. Shakespeare, the greatest playwright of all time uh, under her reign, you know, people were going to plays and, and uh, it, was a, it was a successful run and she was marauding everywhere else, marauding and, and culling resources for the empire. And just say uh, absolute successful. It's even uh, a token of her success. We don't consider her a dictator. Yeah, she's a dictator. You know, she was queen. I this is my thing. I love about the feudal system that the, these fucking countries still have feudal systems. They're celebrating a horrible thing: divine right of kings, oppression. Kings were dictators, and now yeah. they have fucking ceremonial. Why don't yeah. we have cer a ceremonial Führer? 
Why doesn't Germany? Go? He doesn't do any of the bad stuff. He just rolls around and does this yeah. and shit. I mean, it's like, what the fuck? There's no difference between a Hitler yeah. and a fucking king. They did the same horrible shit. Why not a fucking ceremonial conqueror? Alexander the Great walks in, rapes a little bit, but it's all fun. It's for ceremony. He represents the country. Macedonia is Greek. Be doggedly you. I think uh, the magic happens when you are stubbornly, doggedly you, and you meet other people who are doing the same. And um, the real magic of life, the real true currency in this ephemeral life is sort of the communication that happens between people. Uh, that's the real currency. Friendships, love. It's it's cliche, but it's. Uh, I think the meaning of life is to experience to experience love. And uh, I think uh, people often mistake, maybe it's because of Hollywood films and things like that, that love is a feeling, but it's not, it's an action. So uh, that took me a while to learn. And I think that's why I've made decisions since that I think have been good for me and healthy for me. Love is an action. Uh, people can say things, you can feel things. Um, that doesn't mean they're necessarily real. It's all chemical reactions. It's all... Um, tied to our immaturity and uh, psychological issues and uh, survival. But action, when some, when you do things, when you act out of love, and you, the, that's, that's what it's about. Yeah, my parents I'm going to make funny. Yeah, my, my comedy is a hard, hard thing to explain to, uh, you know, an immigrant mother who came here and under Nazi-occupied Crete and became a human rights lawyer and lawyer and... Uh, my brother's a lawyer. My father was a lawyer. You know, clawed his way up. His dad was a was a. Um, so you're a disappointment. I'm the black sheep. Yeah, my brother went to Oxford, Georgetown Law, Brown. <laughs> 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 you know, has a master's in you know good law degrees. My mother has four law, four law degrees. Uh, you know, uh, she was on the Human Rights Commission in New York, up for a judgeship under Dinkins. Um, wrote a, you know, uh, she was the editor of Unitar. She she wrote a seminal piece on the human rights of children for the United Nations. Um, and uh, yeah, I was a comedian. I was always a fuck up. And uh, the, the thing that I was best at, the only thing I was ever decent at was just like making people laugh. I don't know why, I don't know where that comes from. But uh, was there ever a question or did, was there a moment where you decided this is what I'm going to do? There was a moment after I graduated college. Yeah, but I, I was thinking about all types of stuff that, other people imposed on me. And um, I was honest with myself. And uh, once I figured out it was an actual career path, I wasn't even aware. Back then the internet wasn't huge, you know, in late 99, 2000, it wasn't big yet. So I, I didn't, even, I, I thought Robin Williams was just like an actor. I didn't know there was comedy clubs and all. So once I learned that, I was just like, I tried it. Uh, I suffered from massive anxiety. I remember the first time I did comedy, my arms went numb. I started having a massive panic attack. I have my first set. I can show it to you. It's like, I just, I just- I'm going, video. Yeah, I'm video. Oh, I kept nice. going, thank you, thank you, thank you. And the reason why I kept saying thank you is because I forgot my whole jokes. I was so scared. Yeah. And then they laughed because of the amount of times I said thank you. Yeah. And then once they laughed, I was, I remembered the whole thing. And I did the five minutes and I remember getting off. And for a person who never felt like he had a place anywhere, nothing ever felt right. That felt like, okay, I found it. This is what I'm supposed to do. Yeah. This is it. It was the only time in my life I felt that. I haven't felt it since. Never felt it before. So it's the only thing I can do. And um, yeah, I had that. That's awesome. That sounds like you're following what's doggedly you. And also I think uh, just, to, just to piggyback off it, I think that means no matter what it is. Because I think our uh, uh, the American dream is sold. Like, hey, if you're not Beyonce or if you're not famous, you're not worth it. I hate that. And that's what I love so much about certain countries like Sweden. It's a, it's like um, where everyone has healthcare and stuff like that because everyone's a little, is valued more. It's like whatever, if you want to be a doorman, do it. Like it's all the same. Prince was not happy. There's no, just because you're rich or famous, you're still the same guy. Yeah. Whether your possessions are a lot little, you know, it's like, I, I, I have met some doormen. I have met some tax cabbers that I, I lie to you not are more fascinating. I have comedians are horrible people. Some <laughs> I want to get away from all of them. I have very few friends, Paul yeah. Verzi, Tim Dillon, who are comedians because they're awful, awful people. Some of the people who you know the most, who are the most famous, are not who they say they are. Usually yeah. that's the case. They're putting on that public facade because they're fucking sociopaths. Yeah. They're horrible people. 
And some of the most beautiful people I've met and the most interesting people I've met have regular jobs. There is no shame in any fucking job. We don't all have to be rappers with yeah. like rims. I, it's just a weird thing. It means so much to me to hear you say that. I really appreciate it. I'm a big fan of yours and Have Me On has been amazing. And just thank you, man. Thank you Thanks, for uh, having me on. And people, if they want to watch my special, it's called Blowing the Light. It's on YouTube. And please come listen to Long Days of the Podcast. This is the Lex Free Podcast.